meeting of the St. Paul City Council to order. Roll call. Prince. Here. Tao. Tolbert. Here. Yang. Here. Jalali. Here. Naker. Council President Brenmon. Here. And I see Council Member Tao is here. Here. Six present, one absent, being Council Member Naker, who is excused. Please stand and join Council Member Tolbert as he leads us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Council Member. Consent agenda items three through 14 are before you for your consideration. Is there anything that should be taken off consent for separate consideration? Seeing none, Mr. Tom moves consent. Any discussion? Roll call. Prince? Aye. Tao? Aye. Tolbert? You're muted, Council Member? Yes. Yang? Aye. Jalali? Aye. Council President Brenmon? Aye. Six in favor, no one opposed. The consent agenda is adopted. Council Member Tolbert moves suspension of the rules. Roll call. Prince? Aye. Tao? Aye. Tolbert? Yes. Sorry. Yang? Aye. Jalali? Aye. Council President Brenmon. Aye. Six in favor, no one opposed. Rules are suspended. We have a staff report from the administration regarding the police budget. All right, thank you. And today we have Deputy Mayor Jamie Tincher here to um, share with us the city mayor's uh, budget proposal for the police department. Um, as we've mentioned a few times uh, over the course of the day, we are setting our levy limit next Wednesday. And it's imperative for us to have information in front of us regarding the city budget, particularly the general fund departments in advance of that um, momentous occasion in one week from today. Um, so we're um, welcoming the, the mayor's office and Deputy Mayor Tincher in to share the presentation of the police uh, budget. Uh, so with that, we have that information in front of us as we head to the levy limit. So welcome, thank you for being here today. We look forward to hearing your information. Thank you, Council President. Um, we're here today at the request of Mayor Carter to present his uh, proposal for the 2022 police budget. Uh, I'd like to ask Director McCarthy to start off our presentation with just high level information about the 2020 proposed city budget. Uh, good afternoon, Council Members. I'm John McCarthy, uh, Director of the Office of Financial Services. Uh, I will run through some details of the Mayor's 2022 proposed budget uh, for the Police Department. Uh, as Council President noted, we want to make sure that the Council has adequate information as you prepare to set the uh, property tax levy limit next week. Uh, the 2022 proposed general fund budget totals about $344 million. It's funded through a variety of revenue sources, uh, the two largest of which, as you all know, I, are local government aid, uh, which amounts to about 21% of the general fund budget, uh, and property taxes, which amount to about 45%. So combined uh, property taxes and LGA make up about 66% of our general fund revenues. Um, among our general fund departments, emergency response accounts for 51% of the total general fund budget uh, with the police department making up about 30% of general fund spending. As our largest general fund department, the 2022 proposed general fund police budget totals uh, just over $104 million. Uh, this slide reflects 2020 actual spending, 2021 adopted budget, and 2022 proposed budget for all general fund departments. Um, combined with special funds and other revenues, the 2022 police budget proposal totals uh, about $120.8 million across all funds. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this slide shows the breakdown of the police general fund budget by major category. Uh, like all other general fund departments, most of the police budget goes to employee salaries and benefits. About 93% of police's budget is for employee expenses, including uh, salaries, benefits, and work comp. 
uh, the next had highest category uh, of expenses in the police budget uh, related to fleet maintenance and motor fuel costs, uh, but far and away salaries and benefits are the, the largest chunk of the budget. Uh, there are several significant changes to the police budget included in the mayor's proposed budget for 2022. Uh, they're summarized here on this slide. Uh, a significant increase is to cover salary and benefit increases that will be finalized in labor negotiations. The growth in what it costs to pay for existing police staff accounts for about $2 million in new spending for 2022. Uh, the mayor's proposed budget also adds another $1.7 million in salary and benefit costs to restore the attrition budget back to the uh, 2020 levels. The department uh, managed to a higher attrition target in 2021 instead of eliminating filled positions uh, amid the pandemic. This increase uh, for 2022 will ensure that the department can hire up to their authorized strength uh, and which is bolstered by the mayor's approval of moving forward with the police academy this fall. Uh, the proposed budget also includes 820,000 of ongoing general fund support for the law enforcement uh, career path academy which has previously been funded through grants and private philanthropic funding so this will provide stable ongoing funding for this important program. Uh, similar to the fire department, as we discussed this morning, there's a small increase in the police budget added uh, for new costs of replacing HVAC filters. And the budget also replaces one sergeant position with a civilian uh, municipal garage supervisor to oversee police's fleet operations. And this is a net neutral change, uh, no added cost for that change. Uh, Director McCarthy, question. but yeah, yeah bef before you shift, I, I think that um, bef when, you're uh, through with your slides. Um, if we could just spend a minute talking about attrition um, reduction and just understanding um, that item. So I'm just kind of, you're marking that for later, talking about the ARP piece for that. And then if anybody, while, while you're going through the slides, if somebody from budget could look at, um, and this might, might be too big of an ask, let's do this on the spot, but I'm um, just, we spent, we did write um, or approve an amendment to pay for police overtime um, with ARP money this year. And I cannot remember that number off the top of my head, but if we can look at that, because I think these things are, I mean, obviously COVID um, in, in some ways unprompted, but also overtime prices go up when attrition is high. So if there's any way that we can kind of look at those things side by side when we get to that point, I would appreciate that. But um, Sorry to interrupt you, but I just want to make sure that we save a little bit of time to talk about that because that seems to be the sticking point here um, for confusion. Thank uh, thanks, thanks, Council President. And we do have additional slides related to attrition uh, right. coming up. And um, just to while I'm thinking of it, though, the the amendment uh, with ARP for additional overtime support for the police department was nine hundred and seventy five thousand. OK, thank uh, you for this year. Um, the proposed budget also includes two notable spending shifts from the police budget to other departments. First, as was requested by the police department, the proposed budget shifts $4.6 million in costs to the emergency management department for the city's contract with Ramsey County for the emergency communication center. Uh, and the proposal also shifts about 455,000 from police to the city attorney's office for St. Paul's uh, community ambassadors contract. That contract will now be administered by the Office of Neighborhood Safety. Um, so when you account for these, these two shifts, the 2022 proposed police general fund budget uh, change is about a $4.3 million increase over the 2021 adopted budget. Next slide, uh, moving to, to staffing. This slide reflects the police department's organizational structure uh, across um, all their different divisions. Uh, a lot of detail on here, but the important note here at a high level is that there are 763 FTEs for, uh, included in the police budget for 2022. Next slide. Uh, this slide reflects FTEs by fund. There's no change in total FTEs between 2021 and 2022. Uh, the only change, as noted on this slide, is the addition of a civilian fleet manager position to replace the sergeant that had previous uh, position that had previously covered those fleet uh, duties. And so that is reflected in the, uh, the numbers towards the bottom of an addition of a civilian position. Um, but again, net neutral in terms of costs. Um, we're going to pause just a second. I see before you leave the slide, I see Ms. Prince has a hand up, and I do want to point out that one of the um, last week we were a bit confused about the sergeant fleet, you know, kind of, and it looks like where sworn strength goes down one, 
every civilian replaces a sworn officer for the fleet position. So that's, um, thank you for that clarification. And um, Ms. Prince. And this is, this is just for, for anybody um, watching the meeting. I just, on the, the couple of slides ago, where you had the 2 million in new spending for um, pay increases and so forth. I, I just want to be clear that that number comes out of labor negotiations. And that is part of every department is going to see those kind of increases that are negotiated through um, your negotiations with our unions. But that two million doesn't re represent any kind of new money, and in fact, it's dictated by labor negotiations outcomes. Yes, thank you for that um, clarification, and we are seeing that across the departments. Thank you, uh, Council President Brenmo and Council Member Prince. It's a good point, and it's not, yeah, it's reflected in every department budget, and uh, always has been um, as we, you know, work through labor negotiations. That's how we. Um, build budgets to make sure we account for those costs. Um, part of it is through labor negotiations. The other is our healthcare contract, which like all healthcare costs tends to go up every year. And so we incorporate those costs in, into department budgets. And again, as a staffing heavy department, those costs are significant in the police department. Thanks for clarifying. Um, lastly, this slide reflects uh, total FTEs across all departments and all funds. Across city departments, the police department has the largest staffing complement at 600 and uh, 763 FTEs followed by 594 FTEs in parks and 496 FTEs in fire. Uh, if there are no additional questions on, on that component, I'll, I'll turn it back to Deputy Mayor uh, Tincher who will now walk through uh, information on authorized sworn strength and attrition. Thank you. And is that number on parks and recreation not doesn't contemplate seasonal employees or is that the all FTE as a as a thing, not as a person. Council President Brenmo, and it's FTE is a thing. So right, there are in <laughs> seasonal, there'll be, you know, 50 headcount that make up 10 FTE or, or something like that uh, when you when you factor in that seasonal um, impact. Gotcha. Thank you for that. Yeah. Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you, Council President Brenmo. And uh, there are a number of questions that we received from the council and with the next few slides, we hope to provide some information that answers those questions. Uh, with the shift in a fleet manager position from a sworn officer to a civilian position, the mayor's 2022 proposal includes an authorized sworn strength of 619 as part of the 763 FTE total for the department, which remains the same from the 2021 adopted budget to the 2022 proposal. And logically, this shift should have no impact on the number of officers responding to 911 calls. The ongoing conversations regarding total FTEs in the department and authorized sworn officers have really not gone a level deeper, which is really what's needed. And the mayor's key concerns are always how many women and men are needed to respond to 911 calls and how many women or men when women and men are needed to do the investigative work to hold people accountable for the crimes they commit. And when we examine the various crises and emergency situations that our officers are responding to on a daily basis, how many women and men are needed for specific units? The mayor has consistently relied on data review and analysis for his recommendations. In 2019, our officers responded to 75,852 calls to 911. And in 2020, that number was 75,452. One of the key observations that emerged from the Community First Public Safety Commission's work was that data is not collected um, in a way that tracks the evolution of calls from the initial call type and the priority level through the response and outcome. So including whether the situation changes or escalates. And this reality makes analysis of current response models really difficult. Further, there's no measure of satisfaction or resolution of calls, which could help identify areas of success or potential improvement. And leadership from Ramsey County Emergency Communications Center participated in the commission. And we know that they are committed to systems change and innovation that could help us improve our data and ultimately response. On the next slide, predicting and calculating the attrition rate in the police department is a financial tool and we use it to manage the budget. Attrition accounts for employees who leave either voluntarily through retirement or resignation or involuntarily through termination and other factors. 
Financial planning based attrition is used in all departments. It is simply an exercise of forecasting the number of expected vacancies within a department to help track FTEs toward meeting the budget that is set. It is not something that is used to activate hiring processes. Um, the mayor asked the police department to work with the Office of Financial Services and Human Resources to develop a model for hiring in the police department that could flatten that curve that we see year over year due to the long timeline for the hiring process for police officers. So specifically, the question was, and frankly still is, can we hire above the authorized strength at the beginning of the process where we see the curve start to dip so that we can stay much closer to the needed number of sworn police officers throughout the year? And let me walk through this year's hiring process and timeline, which may help further explain these slides that we um, that we got from the police department. In August, uh, SPPD put in requisitions for the hiring of 65 officers. That allows the department to provide conditional job offers to police officer candidates for an October police academy. The conditional job offers then facilitate the medical background and psychological evaluation process, which takes a couple of months to complete. The graduates of the October Academy are expected to graduate from the Academy in February of 2022, and then are expected to complete their field training in June of 2022. So the recap of the current hiring timeline is in August of 2021, the, depart the department determined and confirmed with the mayor the number of conditional job offers that will be made for police officers that will fill projected staffing needs in June of 2022. That's because the medical background and psychological evaluation process takes two to three months. It's then four months for the academy and then four months for field training. The financial timeline requires budgeting for the background check and evaluation process, the academy costs, and the salaries for officers from graduation through field training and into sworn officer status. So looking at their staff projections, the department predicts that they will have 545 police officers deployed when the October Academy completes their field training. That would mean we would be at 610 sworn police officers in June of 2022. However, that assumes all successfully complete the process, that all the predicted vacancies occur, and or that anticipated ones do not happen. What we're trying to do is meet a budget with a lot of staffing variables and a long hiring process and timeline. In 2020, the fire department piloted a hiring model with the theory that we could flatten their curve that we see in authorized strength by hiring more full-time firefighters, literally just higher above the authorized strength at the beginning of the process when they have an academy. The goal was to have less overtime coverage of shifts because we wanted rested, healthy employees responding to emergency situations. The fire department committed to meeting a reduction in their overtime budget in exchange for the increase in their staffing budget. The model has been successful. The fire department has increased average daily staffing while holding down their overtime. And that said, the way that the police department and the fire department staff their shifts is completely different and it's not necessarily an apples to apples comparison. However, there is no disagreement that we would all prefer to have the right number of emergency responders on staff rather than rely on overtime shifts to respond to needs. The next slide, St. Paul continues to experience the public health, public safety and economic- Deputy safety. Mayor, do, sure. do you mind before you leave that slide if I just interrupt quickly? Um, yes. I really appreciate the, the information, the explanation, but if you could, um, I think, Mr. Leggett is in charge, but if you could pop back one. Um, is there is there any reason why we don't just have two smaller academies per year? Uh, Council President Bradmoen, that's a really great question. And, um, you know, the administration is open to whatever good ideas. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that what we would need to do is just factor in and work with the department on, you know, what would be the costs of putting on multiple academies. And, you know, just again, we can budget to whatever the costs are um, and, you know, creative thinking is very much welcome. Okay, it just it just seems to me that it's a, like to wait and then fill up and wait and fill up just has these inherent built in problems. And so if there was a way, especially with the Rowan um, Center, we have the facility, we don't have to rent it. Um, 
So I, I would be interested in looking at, at that as another model to achieve the same goals as you're mentioning. And I do think, I mean, I mentioned this <clears throat> last week, I, I really don't, um, I don't like the idea of having our um, public safety officers show up tired, untrained, you know, not going from call to call and not able to give people their full attention or, um, and so I, I do think that if we can study it out, not increase um, the sworn strength, but just steady it out over the course of a year, that it would be meet a lot of um, the goals that have been discussed. Um, Ms. Prince. Thank you, Council President Brinmoan, for that idea. I think um, I think that is a that is a really great mm -hmm. starting point. And I just want to clarify, um, Deputy Mayor Tincher, did you say that we'll we'll be down to five? 45 officers um, when we're able to hire up to 610 in June of 2022. Did I, did I get that right? Uh, Council President Bredmond, Council Member Prince, um, that, is, that is the number that our best predictions, literally the, the crystal ball um, predicts that we would be at 545. Again, that, that prediction is based on um, a, a lot of experienced people in the department um, making guesses about retirements and, and staff attrition and things like that. And, and I really appreciate that and, and just the straightforward presentation of that. I mean, I think, I think therein lies the problem that we're 545 would be um, 74 below the full sworn strength. And then when we are able to hire, it optimi I imagine this is optimistic hiring, we still don't even reach sworn strength. Um, we, we get up to 610 and, and 619 is our sworn strength. But but it's good to have these numbers and to be able to all be looking at the same thing. So I, I really appreciate the presentation. Thank you. Um, so I'll go to the next slide. Um, through all the interconnected challenges we continue to face, we remain committed to a comprehensive, coordinated and data-driven approach to public safety. The framework shown on this slide was designed by Mayor Carter and our administration has been working across multiple city departments and in partnership with Ramsey County, St. Paul Public Schools, nonprofits, business leaders, and community groups to operationalize this model. We've expanded our public safety approach to go beyond responding to emergencies after they happen. We are coordinating our response efforts, aligning the work of all of our partners, and making strategic investments toward reducing the number of emergencies we endure in the first place. Mayor Carter and his administration has been focused on partnering with our police officers, firefighters, and EMTs to add supports that advance targeted intervention efforts that can interrupt cycles of crime and violence, such as youth workers, social workers, public health professionals, housing counselors, grief counseling, youth jobs, and workforce training. One element of Mayor Carter's Community First Public Safety Framework was the convening of a commission with the ambitious goal of re-envisioning public safety in St. Paul. The commission was a diverse group of 48 individuals representing a wide array of perspectives, including community organizations, education, business, law enforcement, faith communities, and cultural and affinity groups. Designated representatives from the city of St. Paul and Ramsey County joined to serve as resources during the process. Midway through their work, commissioners expressed a desire to define and name the problem we are trying to solve. The Citizens League created the following graphic encompassing the five major areas of desired impact that emerged from the commission in our community. More appropriate responders for each situation who can best assist those in need, more efficient deployment of law enforcement, reserve and focus police resources for where they are most needed, decriminalize behavior and response, particularly for people and communities of color, focus on prevention and community safety, improve systems and increase accessibility. From the work of the commission, high level recommendations emerged for alternative response to priority four and five calls for service based on eight call types identified by the commission as greatest interest. 
Additionally, commissioners provided specific recommendations for skills of first responders and or resources, resources that would help achieve optimal outcomes for our communities who are calling 911 and responders. As the Community First Public Safety Commission was convening and doing their work, the many partners on this slide were engaged in collaboration to respond to the unsheltered homelessness crisis that was happening in our city and to address the public safety concerns in downtown through what were named area action plans. Both of these efforts demonstrate the Community First Public Safety framework in action. We certainly have not solved all of our challenges and we have a lot of work to do, but we have found an answer to how we should do the work to achieve the outcomes that we want in public safety. Take away any single partner from the work and we would not get the same results. And if we want to keep getting more and better results and outcomes, we need to keep identifying more of our gaps and more ways that additional partners can contribute. As you all know, we saw an unprecedented increase in the number of people experiencing unsheltered homelessness during the pandemic. In St. Paul, thanks to the work of all the partners detailed in the previous slide, we were able to realize a tenfold decrease in the number of individuals sheltering outdoors. And I think Council President Brenmullen was the best quote that I've seen to describe it. The response from city, county, and service providers in response to the highly visible crisis around unsheltered individuals was like nothing I've seen. We stopped blaming each other and started pulling together to solve a very serious and complex problem. We've also seen an incredible impact in this collaborative effort with our area action plan work which focused on coordinating numerous partners and jointly strategizing about ways to reduce violence, crime, and negative behaviors in a specific geographic location. As I said, we all know we have a lot of work to do, but our goal is to continually improve our response for people in crisis, as well as to emergency and non-emergency situations. One effort toward that goal is that we have a work group convening now with the task of advancing a proposal for a rapid response team comprised of social workers. The proposal is a concept developed by our service providers at Listening House, Safe Space, and Catholic Charities. The idea is that we hire and place social workers and mental health professionals in our shelter and day space service organizations. However, they are on call for their entire shift and are able to respond immediately to a situation when called by the police firefighters, or EMTs. We're gonna to continue to map out the details and work through the logistics, but I wanna talk about examples of where we envision this type of team that is available 24 seven, with a particularly emphasis on business, after business hours and overnight and where they could be useful. I'm not gonna play the video that's linked here, which is about seven minutes, um, but it shows the last part of a situation that was a multi-hour response to a number of emergency for, by a number of emergency responders from both police and fire departments. I'm extremely proud of the way that our police officers responded in this situation. They displayed a lot, they displayed a lot of patience and care. They kept this individual protected from traffic. They allowed this person to stay in the street and helped uh, this individual get on the bus. However, while this individual was uh, getting on the bus while this individual getting on the bus cleared that situation um, from this specific location, we don't know whether it resolved her needs. Through the lens of the five major areas of impact that emerged from the Community First Public Safety Commission, if we had the team that I just talked about, would they be effective additional responders for the situation? Additionally, if we had that team, could we have released some of the emergency responders from being on that scene the entire time? Would it help provide more efficient deployment of law enforcement, reserve and focus police resources where they are needed most? The next three slides are specific examples of situations our officers are navigating where alternative response options may be optimal. These are photos and communications received from neighbors and businesses uh, near Listening House who's providing day services. Quote, we are also very concerned about our clients being exposed to the never ending urination defecation near the buildings vandalism, vagrancy, begging, fights, and screaming, litter, including condoms and syringes, and apparent drug use since the Freedom House opened. Our entire multi-department team at the city, along with our partners at the Downtown Alliance and our service providers, are trying to prevent all of these things from happening. And we're focusing on improving our systems of support and increasing accessibility because a purely law enforcement response, things like citations and arrests for these behaviors, are just not effective at sustainably solving these issues. 
The next slide um, are emails that depict a very clear example of situations where there are more appropriate responders than police officers, which would provide more efficient deployment of law enforcement, as well as reserve and focus police resources where they are most needed. And my final example, this situation is an example of the need to de decriminalize behavior and response, particularly for people in communities of color. There was a particular section of the Community First Public Safety Report that I think sums up well the challenges we have as we work to try to find optimal responses to these examples and many other specific situations. And I'll quote, there was acknowledgement that changing an existing system or creating a new alternative system is difficult and can feel risky due to the uncertainty inherent in change. Law enforcement members of the commission, for example, expressed reservation about having other agencies or groups respond to calls and put their lives in danger or take the type of risks that police officers accept as part of their jobs. However, the current system of emergency response as explored and analyzed by the commission is strained in its capacity with police officers being asked to respond to an array of situations and is creating trauma, stress, and loss of life, particularly for communities of color. Commissioners were interested in ways to innovate alternative response models in, iter in iterative ways to build trust and reduce anxiety and then expand successful practices as they are identified. In closing, the mayor remains focused on continuing to leverage our community first public safety framework and the recommendations of the community first public safety commission. This will, this will continue to include expanding opportunities for alternative and co-responder models, increasing the efficiency of officer time and working to identify opportunities to modernize every interaction between community members and officers, including limiting traffic stops for non-safety related violations so officers can focus their energy on responding to and preventing crime. With these efforts, we'll continue to focus on enhancing the capacity of our public safety systems, improving connectivity and supports, and designing our public safe spaces for safety. With that, Director McCarthy and I are open to answer any questions. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Are there uh, questions for uh, Director McCarthy or Deputy Mayor Tincher? I see Ms. Jalali and then Mr. Tao. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for making this time and getting these clarifications. This is really important and helpful. Um, a top line thing that would be helpful is, and I am happy to get this info now or just as a follow up, but um, when the summary, when the summary point is like, here's a 4 million increase that we're proposing, it would be helpful to understand um, or just confirm my understanding of that this much of it is like contractually obligated increases that are that we are locked into. This much is like an attrition um, offset that is being paid for by ARP. And then this much is like city funds on top of that. Is there, I know that we got this expanded over many, but could, could I just get that breakdown one more time? Because I think increases can mean different things or they come, the breakdown actually comes from a range of things. That would be helpful. Just what the, what is the high level breakdown of that? Um, Council President Bredmoen, Council Member Jalali, uh, Director McCarthy, do you want to take a stab at that here? And then what we can commit to is we'll we'll go back and we'll make sure that we get it to you in a uh, a vetted format. Yeah, Council President Bredmoen, Council Member Jalali, at a at a really high level, about two million dollars is for those uh, contracted salary and benefit uh, cost increases. Um, and then the attrition funded through ARP is another 1.7 million. Those are the two biggest increases. And then on top of that, there's the 820,000 for the uh, LACPA uh, program. Those three are the biggest um, biggest changes in the department budget. And so that I understand, the LACPA 820,000 is proposed what's the funding source for that? Is it levy funding or a federal grant or what? where does that come from? Uh, Council President Brenmo, uh, Council Member Jolly, it is a general fund levy support. It had previously been funded through grants, but those sources and, and private uh, donations, as we understand it, those sources are drying up. And so this provides ongoing general fund support for that program. So about 2 million um, 
contractually required. We have to pay our employees because they're labor represented under the law. This is what they get under the negotiations and the, what the what their what their uh, benefits and salary are. That's two million. That's general fund ARP one point seven million for funding uh, for attrition offset, which is also a budgeting process every department is doing, and then eight hundred twenty thousand also general fund for LECPA. That's correct. Okay, that is. Um, made so much clearer now. Thank you. And I really appreciate having this information. There's a lot to absorb. So I'm just going to keep absorbing, but that top line is very helpful. Thank you for explaining that. Thank you, council member, uh, Mr. Tao. <clears throat> thank you, council president. Um, Deputy mayor, thank you for being here today and uh, with the presentation and as well as um, uh, director McCarthy. I I'm just curious, like one of the, uh, the slide that show the different program um, that um, is being initiated or is already impl implementation. And I know if I asked this question before, and I know I've been very supportive of those new initiative. Um, with the homicide being uh, very similar to last year, um, what are the pro what are the goals for those program and reduction of homicide? And then we've also have shots fired um, uh, that continue to increase. And so, um, what are some actual outcome out of those to be to reduce um, the homicide and, and the shot fire, burglary, uh, different things in the city? Uh, Council President Bren Malin, Council Member Tao. I mean, I, I would venture that our our goal are to have zero homicides in the city of St. Paul. Um, that should be our goal. Um, and the some of the efforts um, certainly, really great police work. Um, and I know that uh, that our department speaks often about the the investigations and the the case closures and the really impressive work that happens by our investigators. Um, that's a component of it. Some of the other components are um, efforts like community ambassadors um, working with our young people. Um, we have incredible parks staff that are doing great work in that space. Um, it's our partnership with Healing Streets um, to do intervention strategies that are based on, um, you know, uh, intervening before there's retaliatory violence, um, grief counseling, um, and then just all of the social determinants of health, I would argue, are the same determinants of gun violence and crime and the things that we're seeing. And so, um, a comprehensive strategy with all of our partners. That's that's what we need so that we can um, have less of those situations that are happening. Um, the other thing that I would say is um, gun laws and and just frankly, like the proliferation of guns that we're seeing coming into our city and the amount of guns that our police officers are having to get off of our streets. That's a piece of it. So what I'm hearing is that, thank you for that. So what I'm hearing is that these initiative and the program, we don't actually have a um, a targeted goal to of homicide reduction per year. Um, we um, so we don't have that yet, and then we don't have um, a real number about how many guns we want to take off the street. Um, though uh, we are taking guns off the street, we don't have an actual number for that. Um, I'm hearing that. And then I'm in, in the program that we described, we talk about intervention and prevention. So those are very strategic and we need to do those. Um, I think, and, and then we also talk about healings and working with vic, um, victims and gun violence so that they don't um, retaliate. But I, I don't hear a lot about just regular victim, right? Like regular folks who um, get their garage broken into, or they get hot carjacked, or I, you know, I think those those members of the community um, also need to be um, protected or served in, in the same way. Um, and so, is that part of the conversation going forward? Council President, Council Member Tao. Of course, that's part of the conversation, and I would say that we do have strategies that are uh, very much pegged to goals um, around crime and violence. And um, I, I would, I would offer that um, we have public safety professionals in the police department that could speak much more clearly about 
the data and the analysis that would go into you know how we how we target those uh, those reductions in the same way that with catalytic converter theft there was a team in the police department that came together and they put a strategy together and and we're tackling that um, car theft um, all carjackings um, we have really exceptional uh, employees at the at the police department that um, they they have the skills and the expertise and the knowledge to put those strategies together I, I don't have that at my fingertips but i can guarantee you that there are individuals at the department that um, that's what they're doing every day day in day out um, to tackle those those uh, those challenges that we're facing in our city Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tao. Um, Councilmember Prince. Thank you, um, Council President Brenmon, and thank you, Deputy Mayor Tincher. Um, I I really appreciate um, you know the 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 way we're we're able to talk about this today. I think your recognition mm -hmm. in your responses to Councilmember Tao, and pertaining to the area action plans. Um, makes really clear that we are very fortunate to have the police department and the chief we have um, leading us through this really dynamic time in, in both law enforcement and community and police relations. And so I really appreciate that. I also, um, in terms of, of Council Member Tao's questions about our community first public safety efforts, um, you know, I think I, I think, you know, about a year ago, or I think it was maybe December of 2020, um, we had a presentation on those programs. And then I, we may have had another one, I think maybe in April or May of this year. We had talked about having those reports to council on a quarterly basis. And I think that could be really helpful for us to understand the ways in which these investments are starting to um, show some results in the ways in which um, I know when we have had reports from them that that they're all most of them I mean the community ambassadors healing streets for two I know are working in very close um, cooperation with our police department so I think this is um, I think this is an important conversation we're having today and I think I think we agree um, that we we are, are in a really good place as a city with the team that we have. Mm -hmm. um, one other thing that I wanna bring up is that we spoke with um, Chief Inks today about the 600,000 that he will be coming back to the council with to talk about hiring social workers in the fire department to be part of the community first public safety department, the Office of Neighborhood Safety. And, and I'm supportive of looking at that. One thing I wanna be really mindful of is that when we're talking about um, being able to provide assistance to people in need on a, on a 24 seven basis, that we really need to get the county involved in that investment um, because the county is, um, they, they, they are funded for human services, for mental health mm -hmm. services, for shelter services, for public health and for civil commitments. And so I wanna be clear that we are not taking on a role of hiring social workers to do work on a 24 seven basis when I would, I would ask that we take a hard look at the county being part of that, um, that proposed program. Um, clearly the county has been a really good partner to council president Brenmon's quote on your earlier slide. I think the partnership has been magnificent and, and I have um, just been so pleased with your leadership in having the city fill those gaps that were, were giant, be, had become really gigantic um, 
holes in the programs that are available, safety net for um, unsheltered and um, untreated, people with untreated mental illness. So I, I don't want to have us filling, filling the social work role um, without seeking some uh, participation from the county in that. Um, in any event, thank you for your presentation today. Thank you, uh, Council President Bren Mullen, Council Member Prince. So I think there's three things in that. Um, I, I agree with your comments um, about where we are situated in the city. I would add that um, I, so many days I was so grateful that we have the mayor that we do through all of the turmoil that we went through and that he just at every turn, despite rhetoric and despite a lot of people who want to separate us and polarize us, um, Mayor Carter, speaks so highly about our police department and the work that the, the men and women of that police department do. He is proud of them. And um, I would just add him to that, that piece of the team that we have that is helping us right now. Um, the second thing that I would respond to is um, I know that uh, our, our uh, community led efforts and the healing streets, the community ambassadors, a number of other folks, I know that they are always happy to be on a regular schedule to provide updates. Um, kind of to Council Member Tao's questions, um, I, I would offer and, and suggest to the Council that in addition to that, um, there would be regular updates from the police department and specific efforts that they're doing like catalytic converter theft um, and other specific you know, spaces where um, obviously you and your constituents are very concerned about the strategies and, and how we're addressing those things. So I would just recommend that we add some of that, um, those efforts to the briefings. Um, and then finally, the, the response team. Um, Ramsey County is a terrific partner um, in many ways. And what I would say about the response team, um, as we build it out, the key distinction that I would make is what we found in the work is that um, a really Cliff Notes version of it is that, yes, you're right, Ramsey County um, takes on and, and manages the shelter system and, and the human services, all those kind of supports. And we've sort of said, we're going to step in and we're going to take responsibility and lead in the space of response to crisis um, and emergencies. And what I would offer is that embedding the social workers into our crisis emergency response is the mess, the missing element. And so um, I, I am confident that the, the county is going to continue to partner in those spaces. But if you look at the examples that I provided, and I know that our officers and our firefighters would have many, many other examples, embedding that in our emergency 911 response and in their operations is sort of the focus that we're taking on that and i think we would learn a lot from it and eventually the goal would be um, how could that a team like that be deployed directly from 911 dispatch i don't think that we're there yet but i know that that's another way that the county um, is stepping in and wanting to be a really good partner in that space and, and just to follow up on that, um, the embedded, the co-responder model is something that, that our police department has been doing, I think, since 2017. Um, so, so I know the co-responder um, idea is something that, that has worked for police. Obviously, the COAST unit is, is based on that. I just, when I see us hiring um, several more social workers to put in an office of neighborhood safety. I just want to, I just want to understand the way that works. You know, it, is it a co-responder um, mm -hmm. model and, and how is that going to work? So thank you for that explanation. I just, when we're talking about, and I, and I also appreciate what you're saying about crisis response, but I, I do think that, um, we can't let the county off the hook to be a nine to five responder. I think we need the county involved in the in the 24 seven, whether it's through the sheriff's department or um, however we do that. If it's embedded social workers within the sheriff's office, maybe that's one way to do that. But in any event, um, I hear what you're saying. Thank you for that um, question and for the clarification as well. <clears throat> when we talked to Chief Inks this morning, we um, 
the takeaway was really that this is a program that's still being put together. And so I think if we can make a real clear distinction about what the work we're doing is and how that is different than what the work of Ramsey County is, it'll be helpful for all of us. Um, because I do think that we can't make a shift in the way we do public safety unless we do kind of our, our first responder work differently. Um, but also to Ms. Prince's point, what do we, um, most things happen at two o'clock in the morning or and I shouldn't say most things, but things happen at two o'clock in the morning and that's when we um, need to make sure that support's there. So how do we thread that needle? And I, we do look forward to um, report back from the chief in a month or two um, to fully understand that program and understanding that we're earmarking those resources to get that off the ground and then we'll vet it um, when it gets closer to uh, D-Day, December day, budget day. So um, thank you. Thank you so much for the presentation. I don't see other questions and I know we have other items on our agenda. So I will thank you um, for this presentation and information. I think that puts us in a good spot uh, for the levy limit on uh, next Wednesday, the uh, September 15th. So thank you uh, for your time, for the presentation, for the clarification um, and the information. We, we, we truly do appreciate um, your time. Thank Thanks you so much. Item 15 is first reading of ordinance 21-34, creating chapter 441 of the legislative code pertaining to electric vehicle charging rates at city owned charging stations. Right, and this is a first reading. So we will get a staff report from Samantha Henningsen. Welcome. Hello, Council President, Council President Bren Bowen and council members. Let me pull up presentation here. Did that work? Yep. Um, and I will, this is a bit of a technical presentation. I will try to spin through it as quickly as I'm able to. And there will be follow up in Legistar with a memo that contains the same information in advance of your public hearing next week. So just wanted to note that. So this will be one of the last items that comes before you as we kind of set the groundwork for the EV spot network. And that's uh, to recommend the pricing and ordinance for the price that customers will pay when they charge at our charging network. So just kind of wanted to outline the prior priority principles and considerations that went into this thinking. So we want to cover operating costs. We want to incentivize EV use by maintaining affordable charging rates. We want to maintain competitive rates with nearby chargers, establish a fair rate structure across different types of electric vehicles, encourage home charging where possible, incentivize turnover of EV charging spaces and just make it as easy as possible for the consumer to understand. I also want to highlight here that some of these principles are in competition, right? So we want to cover our operating costs and we also want to uh, maintain an affordable rate. So we've really tried to strike a balance in setting these rates. So the recommendation that's before you um, creates base rates uh, based on electricity usage versus timing since different EV models uh, take different amounts of time to charge. So basing on electricity use is really just the most equitable way to do it. Uh, we will provide an overnight discount of two and a half cents per kilowatt hour to align with Excel's overnight pricing. And um, there will be a per session connection fee to recover the fixed costs kind of above and beyond those electricity costs with a higher connection fee for fast chargers because those have higher fixed costs. We will also, we also recommend instituting dwell, a dwell time penalty for the drivers who overstay the posted sign limits. So this fee will help, again, cover the cost of deployment, maintenance, and operation of the chargers, as well as help encourage driver turnover so that more people can access the network on a reliable basis. And then also before you in the ordinance is to exempt companies who utilize city leased vehicles for car share from both the dwell time penalties and provide a 20% discount on the connection fees in order to ensure long-term viability of publicly supported car share. So I'm not gonna talk through the rates. This is in the ordinance language, um, but this uh, slide deck and the memo that will be before you in Legistar 
includes both the price to the consumer and then the revenue to the city per transaction kind of breaks out the sales tax that we'll be paying as well. And then this just kind of shows how, how all over the map <laughs> uh, charging rates are. So uh, the US average on level two charging is between 20 and 30 cents a kilowatt hour or a dollar to three hours or a dollar to three dollars an hour. And then on the fast charging, the average is $35, 35 cents per kilowatt hour. But again, there's quite the range um, from free, including some of our city's existing chargers to really expensive. So it's just kind of all over the map. Um, and then as you'll see in the following slides, uh, public charging rates tend to be higher than the residential electricity prices, which kind of goes along with just the cost of uh, providing the infrastructure. So the green bar in the middle here on the level two charging rates kind of shows the recommendation before you in comparison with both the blue bar, which is the residential electricity price, and then the equivalent cost for gas at $2.50 a gallon. And then similar chart for fast charging. And then this is just kind of a fun chart <laughs> that shows the volatility of gas prices uh, compared to electricity. And I wanted to include this just because, you know, we've been working on these pricing recommendations for months and months now. And, um, you know, the price of gas has changed. So when we started, you know, the average price of gas was $2.38 a gallon. Uh, the analysis was based at $2.50 a gallon. That was kind of went into these recommendations. But then today's average is three dollars and one cent per gallon. So um, basically, the more volatility there is with gas prices, and the higher those gas prices go, the more savings that will be realized to consumers um, uh, shifting to electric vehicle usage. So also, just kind of wanted to run through really quickly here. I know you have uh, an agenda ahead of you. Uh, the assumptions that went into these recommendations. So we're basically assuming a half a session per day per charger and one um, session per day per, per, per fast charger and that year over year utilization will increase about 12% a year. And on the level two chargers, we'll have about two hours per charge session and 25 minutes for the fast chargers. Um, as part of our contract with Zeph Energy, who is the charging equipment and network provider, they will take a 10% cut on the, for the credit card fees on the public charging transactions. We won't have that on the car share transactions because they won't be utilizing credit cards. And then we had to make an assumption about like, well, how many people do we think are going to overstay their welcome and get um, nicked with the dwell time fee? And you know we we think it'll be five percent. Um, so we just um, based on research, uh, that's kind of the guesstimate at this point. Uh, let's see here. And so I also just wanted to kind of note that while assumptions made here are conservative for the purpose of setting budgets. Um, and operating, planning, uh, the trend lines for electric vehicle adoption are very positive. And this trend should accelerate in Minnesota once the state clean cars rulemaking goes into effect, uh, potentially with uh, the vehicle model year 2025 and potentially even earlier with some of the other provisions that are included in that clean cars rule. Um, so just briefly, just so the council's aware, wanted to kind of uh, talk through the summary of the operating costs that we're looking to recover. So basically it's $30 in electricity per month per EV spot, plus demand charges of 10 to $15 per kilowatt, uh, which changes seasonally. Um, and then we'll have networking fees um, included in the contract with Zeph Energy. You know, those fees are paid for the first five years, but then there'll be some additional charges that'll kick in in years six through 10. And then just we had to make some maintenance uh, projections in terms of part-time staff to 
work on the chargers, um, parts, maintenance, replacement, et cetera. And then just those electricity costs that we talked about earlier. And then um, again, you know, we have used like the best educated guesses that we can, um, but as the program deploys, we'll be able to use the real time data to kind of come back to you and reset the rates as necessary. Um, and then I just wanted to note um, a big thank you to our partners through the American Cities Climate Challenge, um, the Electrification Coalition, Cher Griffith Taylor, and Kelly Blinn from NRDC, as well as Chris Belair, our parking system supervisor, for his insights into deploying this new and incredibly complex system. And then uh, Ian Welsh of the city attorney's office for his ever steady guidance in uh, figuring out the legal underpinnings of this program. So I just talked a lot and I'm happy to answer <laughs> any questions. Uh, thank you. Ms. Hendrickson, thank you so much for the presentation. And I, I am sure that you said this at some point during the presentation, but I understand, I mean, I, I was following the analysis, but did you ever just say, how much does it cost for an average uh, electric car user to charge up one time? I mean, just I don't I don't have an electric car yet, um, but I just have no idea how much does it cost to charge. Um, that will you know that will depend on you know whether you're using a level two charger or a fast charger. Just as an example, as helping doing some of the testing of the bolts, and you know I was charging at a fast charger that you know was like three dollars for a half an hour session. Um, okay. But, you know, that is going to depend, and, you know, and this industry is, you know, so relatively new. And as, you know, the slide that kind of showed the huge range, it will depend on um, where you're charging, but, and for how long. And, and you know, the other piece is, as long as you're plugged in um, to the network, you'll, you'll only pay until you're charged up but we will have like time limits on the parking spots during the day to, get, to again, kind of um, encourage that turnover. Great, thank you. Um, Council Member Jalali. Thanks, um, I just wanted to express appreciation, Samantha. This is very exhaustive and it's clear you've put a ton of work in and I know that making the business model of this um, work when you're trying to also make sure that we're meeting a really strongly held priority, which is serving um, communities and residents who have experienced historical disinvestment and who are already disenfranchised by less transit access, by economic inequity, lower wages, and things that make it harder to actually participate in traditional single car ownership. Um, it's all really important. And I feel grateful that that thought has been put in so that this can be a program that's actually accessible to all of our residents and residents who um, especially are benefiting from this as like a um, supplement, but not replacement to transit. We need to still fight for um, and other investments in just infrastructure and, and better ways to get around. So um, I don't have many questions. I, I'm more just appreciating because I remember the early stages of um, developing this initiative with you and with Russ and with people who have done it in other cities and then with our car and just to see it coming to life is really profound and it does reflect immense amounts of work and um, I think that's worth worth talking about because it, it it is a program that we are hearing about as it advances and as we're getting um, different parts of it built out and I know that they're working on kind of the soft launches and they've looked at the charging locations, things like that. So it's slowly pacing along. But um, personally, I like couldn't be more excited to be able to use this program. And I live near where one of the stops is going to be. And it's just it, it is going to change my life for the better. And I think that's true for a lot of families. So um, I don't have questions. I just wanted to say that I'm really excited. <laughs> Sometimes you just have to be like, this is going to be great. That's all I have to say. Um, so thank you. And um, we just couldn't have a sharper person uh, helping figure this out than you. So thanks, Samantha. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Council Member. And um, Council Member Yang. 
Thank you. I just wanted to express my support for this and excitement as well. And uh, since the first time that I was briefed about this, I've also I've also um, really advocated to see more of the stations be available to the greater east side community as well, because I know it, it basically goes as as far um, uh, east as the Payne Avenue area. And so that's something I'm uh, really looking forward to. And I know that at one point you all were talking about um, a, putting together like either a program or threshold so that you can, uh, so that the, the cars are also accessible to families that struggle financially as well. And so can you uh, talk a bit more about that and and how, if that is something that we are still pursuing, like how you plan to um, have people uh, basically sign up for that as well? Because I remember at one point we were trying to figure out like, do we have them like, create an account or how do we have them share that info so that they qualify for those rates? Councilmember Yang, I will commit to following up with you and the rest of the council on where our car has landed on the rate plans. Um, I know they've been putting in a lot of work and in conversation with their community partners in the neighborhoods that will be newly served. And so I don't want to misspeak on the numbers, but I will follow up with you on that. Thank you. Thank you so much. And this was um, this is an ordinance. So this was our staff report. We will have a public hearing next week and we will vote on September 22nd uh, at their final reading. Um, so thank you, Ms. Henningsen, um, for the staff report here today and for the comments and questions from uh, my colleagues. We appreciate it. And we will see you a couple more times. All right. Thank you. Item 16 is resolution public hearing 21-226 approving the application of Allianz Field for a sound level variance in order to present live amplified sound for the small sums luncheon fundraiser in lot C parking lot outside of Allianz Field on September 23rd, 400 Selling Avenue North. And this public hearing has been held virtually as such Mr. Tom moves to close the public hearing and approve any discussion. Seeing none, roll call. Prince. Aye. Tao. Aye. Tolbert. Yes. Yang. Aye. Jalali. Aye. Council President Brenmon. Aye. Six in favor, no one opposed. The public hearing is closed and the resolution is adopted. Item 17 is resolution public hearing 21-227, approving the application of Big River Pizza for a sound level variance in order to present amplified music for Let There Be Songs to fill the air on October 1st at the St. Paul Farmer's Market. I'm intrigued. <laughs> But what does that mean? All right, so this, <laughs> this public hearing has been held virtually as such. Uh, Ms. Jalali moves to close the public hearing and approve. Any discussion? Seeing none, roll call. Prince? Aye. Tao? Aye. Tobert? Yes. Yang? Aye. Jalali? Aye. Council President Brenmon? Aye. Six in favor, no one opposed. The public hearing is closed and the resolution is adopted. Item 18 is resolution public hearing 21-229, approving the application of Anderson Race Management for sound level variance in order to present live amplified sound on September 25th at Upper Landing Park, 180 Shepherd Road. And this public hearing has been held virtually as such Mr. Tolbert moves to close the public hearing and approve any discussion. Seeing none, roll call. Prince? Aye. Tao. Aye. Tobert. Yes. Yang. Aye. Jalali. Aye. Council President Brenmon. Aye. Six in favor, no one opposed. The public hearing is closed and the resolution is adopted. Item 19, resolution public hearing 21-230, approving the application of American Foundation for suicide prevention for a sound level variance in order to present amplified sound on September 19th at 1199 Midway Parkway. And this public hearing has been held online as such Ms. Jalali moves to close the public hearing and approve any discussion on that motion. Seeing none, roll call. Prince? Aye. Tao? Aye. Tobert? Yes. Yang? Aye. Jalali? Aye. Council President Brenmon? Aye. Six in favor, no one opposed. Public hearing is closed and the resolution is adopted. 
Item 20, Resolution Public Hearing 21-241, approving the application of Allianz Field for a sound level variance in order to present amplified sound for the Washburn Games outside of Allianz, Allianz Field on September 26th at 400 Snelling Avenue North. And this public hearing has been held online as such. Mr. Tao moves to close the public hearing and approve any discussion on that. Motion, seeing none, roll call. Prince? Aye. Tao? Aye. Tobert? Yes. Yang? Aye. Cholali? Aye. Council President Brenmon? Aye. Six in favor, no one opposed. The public hearing is closed and the resolution is adopted. Item 21, Resolution Public Hearing 21-231, authorizing the police department to accept and amend the 2021 budget and activity for these donations of $45,000 for the Grotto Foundation and $8,000 from the Gala Giving Fundraiser for the LECPA program via the St. Paul Police Foundation. All right, and this public hearing has was held uh, online as such Ms. Prince moves to close the public hearing and approve. Uh, any discussion? Seeing none, roll call. Prince? Aye. Tao? Aye. Tobert? Yes. Yang? Aye. Jalali? Aye. Council President Brenmon? Aye. Six in favor, no one opposed. The public hearing is closed and the resolution is adopted. Item 22, Resolution Public Hearing 21-235, authorizing the city to accept a 308000 dollar grant from the St. Paul and Minnesota Foundation for the People's Prosperity Pilot and amending the 2021 budget for the Office of Financial Empowerment. All right, and this public hearing has been held virtually, but we do have um, a staff update um, from Director uh, Karcher Ramos. So let's start with that before we go to a vote. Uh, thank you. Uh, Council President Bren Moen and council members. I know my presentation is on, on the next item, but uh, I'm happy to go now as well. I think that's this one's people's prosperity. The next is college savings. Oops, do you, do you, shall we just vote on this and move on to the next item? That's sure. perfectly fine. All right, so um, Ms. Yang moves to close a public hearing and approve any discussion on the motion. Seeing none, roll call. Uh, Prince? Oh, oops, I'm sorry. Ms. Prince? Yeah. Um, I did have a question, um, Mr. Karcher Ramos. Um, is this additional support that extends the length of the um, People's Prosperity Pilot? Are we, I mean, I know we passed an ordinance creating it, and I just wondered if we are um, doing anything to extend the time frame, or um, can you help me with that, or if we should be getting a, a report on that before we, if we are extending it. Council President Brad Mullen, Council Member Prince, uh, this is not extending it. This is actually the funding to complete, uh, complete the program uh, as we have outlined uh, with the 18 payments uh, for the 150 families. Great, thank you. I, and I, I'm, and I'm fine with that. I just wanted to, to know what we were doing. So thank you. Absolutely. Any other discussion on the motion? Seeing none, roll call. Prince? Aye. Tao? Aye. Tobert? Yes. Yang? Aye. Jalali? Aye. Council President Brenmon? Aye. Six in favor, no one opposed. The public hearing is closed and the resolution is adopted. Item 23 is Resolution Public Hearing 21-236, authorizing the Office of Financial Empowerment to accept a $350,000 grant from the St. Paul Foundation to support program operations for college-bound St. Paul and amending the 2021 budget for the Office of Financial Empowerment. All right. Um, so this item, uh, public hearing has been held virtually. Director, thank you for waiting. I apologize for taking those out of order. Um, and we welcome you for a report. Great. Uh, let me just pull my slides up here. Uh, so Council President Brenbo and Council members uh, just here to give a brief update on College Bound St. Paul. Um, you know, it's sort of timely with us uh, accepting uh, additional dollars uh, 
you know, from from our funders. Um, so just wanted to uh, give an update on, on where things are. And I'm going to start with a, a bit of a, a grounding and refresher and then jump into sort of what we've seen sort of up to date. But uh, as you all know, College Bound St. Paul uh, launched uh, January 1st of 2020. Um, and uh, uh, college savings account again, as you open the account, you grow savings, you attend college or training, um, and then you graduate. Um, and for us, uh, this is any type of post-secondary accreditation, certificate, uh, trade school, um, community college, four-year college, um, whatever it uh, may be. And what we know is that children who have between $1 and $499 in a uh, college savings account that they're three times more likely to go to college and four times more likely to graduate. Um, some folks may ask the question, you know, how can such small dollar accounts, you know, impact it? It's really about beginning the early conversations uh, with, uh, with children, you know, between children and parents and setting parent expectations of post-secondary um, aspirations as well as those post-secondary aspirations for children and uh, the research uh, backs it up you know um, csa programs have a number of different types of impacts uh increasing college attendance and graduation boosting these parents uh expectations for secondary uh post-secondary attainment improving social emotional uh, uh development um, in children which is really around confidence and sort of a positive uh outlook um, actually improves uh, maternal mental health um, again entering sort of hope and um, dreams you know into sort of um uh, families and sort of how that impacts sort of uh, mothers. And then the last is building that college uh, going uh, identity. Um, what we know is around the best practices and design was kind of orbits around these kind of uh, three key areas, which are equity, supporting a college going identity and building savings for the future, and then administrative ease. Um, and uh, one of the key features, you know, is universal enrollment. Um, uh, second is we're the first in the nation and the second column here we're starting at birth the first city in the country that's actually starting a csa program at birth most other all other cities actually start at kindergarten or later and then really thinking about the potential growth you know of the account and uh with our partners you know at bremer bank um is um, our, our financial institution. As you may recall from previous conversations, we ha had put together a 50 member task force um, for a college bound St. Paul. It was really informed by both those impacts and by those um, best practice designs. And what we really did um, is go through the process to really spell that out. And as a reminder, college bound is a universal college savings account program beginning at birth. Um, one thing we highlighted here in the universal eligibility for any babies that are born after January 1st, 2020, um, they, and they are St. Paul residents before their sixth birthday, we hope to catch them again, you know, at kindergarten. So our real hope is that this class of 2020, um, you know, babies that were born in 2020, that by kindergarten, uh, you know, entry that will have 100% uh, of those uh, you know, babies enrolled. It is a $50, um, you know, seed deposit, um, again, to launch those accounts, but they also um, can grow those accounts, you know, um, through different types of bonuses, milestones. Um, we have them listed there, such as um, connecting with the, the College Bound Portal itself, um, first birthday bonus, completing surveys, um, participating in early childhood wellness types of activities, financial health activities, um, you know, folks can, um, you know, babies can begin to build their accounts, you know, with their families, obviously, at these early stages. And, of course, families can deposit, you know, at a, at a bank branch or, you know, through direct deposit. Um, our program is being rigorously evaluated by a national expert, Dr. Willie Elliott. Um, at the University of Michigan. Uh, he's written books on college savings accounts, and while we're really, really fortunate to uh, um, both get consultation, advice, recommendations, um, as well as sort of the rigor um, of the sort of evaluation uh, uh, with, uh, you know, having Dr. Elliott sort of at our side, at our uh, disposal, really, at any point in time that we have any questions and, um, you know, put together sort of a couple reports for us a year on sort of program improvements and those sort of things. And, in his uh, year one report, he said college bound is in a developmentally appropriate stage, right where we should be at, um, at the end of year one of implementation. And he said, despite launching in a pandemic and among 
uh, racial unrest, you know, in, in the Twin Cities. And he actually writes pretty extensively around the impact, you know, of those types of things. And, um, you know, so the numbers I talk about are, you know, within sort of this realm is even if those, uh, that pandemic didn't hit um, and if racial unrust hadn't happened, um, we're in the spot where we're exactly supposed to be sort of at year, um, you know, in, in our sort of program design. So really through the end of June, um, which is our most enroll most recent enrollment data, we have just over 4,500 uh, babies and toddlers enrolled in the program, uh, just uh, under $550,000 of savings, of which uh, there's about $230,000 in seed deposits and $315,000 in other savings. So this could be families contributing themselves. This could be them earning and engaging with the account. This could be participating in financial wellness. Um, or early childhood types of programming. The average size of those 4,565 uh, accounts is $119, so $69 above uh, that initial seed deposit. And then the most saved in a single account right now is just above uh, $1,500. Uh, um, College bomb uh, babies, toddlers, families live in every corner, every ward of the city. This is sort of a heat map of uh, where the concentrations are, but we definitely see, uh, you know, participants in literally every single corner um, of our of our city. And this is uh, uh, where, you know, families with babies live, you know, particularly, you know, where you see sort of these these hot spots, uh, you know, throughout uh, throughout the city. Um, this would not be possible without a whole network of community partners. Um, outreach referral enrollment partners from Ramsey County to the Y to the Public Housing Authority to Neighborhood House, Prepare and Prosper, Clues, the St. Paul Public uh, Schools, Office of Early Learning, um, other city departments like the libraries and parks. Um, so many folks are sort of joining in, um, you know, to support our work. And then we also have a group of 25 ambassadors, college-bound ambassadors who are engaging with families through grassroots efforts. They also receive uh, leadership development. And really what you see here um, in this picture is actually a drive-through baby shower where we had to adapt um, our sort of approach to how we, we engage. So that's our ambassador, a number, a few of our ambassadors um, who are running that uh, baby shower. <laughs> it was their idea, they came up with it. So we, uh, uh, we we implemented it um, and uh, ended up being you know uh, a really great you know program. One thing we always encourage folks to do is pre-register before your baby is born. You can go on the College Bound site. It is translated into five different languages, um, and folks can go and pre-register you know before the the baby their babies are born. Um, and even after your baby is born, you can enroll. Um, you know if you moved into the city later or somehow. You know, you didn't get enrolled. We do have auto enrollment, um, you know, but there is a group of folks, you know, of course, who, you know, will fall between the cracks and we want to make sure that they're able to, uh, we're able to get them sort of enrolled at any point. As you look at our line of sight to the future, we're really looking at our next steps for impacting the financial health and early childhood wellness, you know, through College Bound St. Paul. Um, we're developing a early childhood equitable um, action plan. Uh, we're working on sort of program development for um, school-aged years, and then we're looking at sort of capitalizing on our uh, Fund for the Future uh, campaign, which will continue to fund uh, College Bound, you know, into the future. And I just want to end by just talking about a few instances, you know, of College Bound and, um, you know, some of the, the things that we've, we've heard, right? Uh, we heard from a mom and dad uh, living in council member uh, Bren Moen's ward, um, you know, who said they didn't go to college, um, but uh, the opening up the, the college savings account really entered that for the first time, even as a newborn child, uh, that their child could go to college and that, hey, I, I could throw in, you know, uh, $20, you know, a month uh, into this college savings account. We had another um, mom, you know, who was in uh, Council Member Prince's ward, who uh, is uh, LPN, you know, at a hospital, and uh, uh, we saw her actually, I mean, the mayor were out, and we saw her at a park, um, and the mayor asked basically every single uh, person in St. Paul uh, if they have an infant <laughs> or toddler, if they're enrolled in college bound, and she's like, yes, actually, um, you know, I, uh, you know, uh, signed up for direct deposit, you know, for my college, my baby's college savings account. 
And then the last is uh, uh, an auntie who, um, whose uh, you know, brother and uh, sister-in-law had their child taken away in child protection at the hospital. Um, and she became the emergency foster care you know, for the child. Um, and she heard about College Bound St. Paul and signed up you know, the, the, the baby um, you know, for it and really sees it sort of as, uh, despite sort of hard circumstances of being separated you know, from, um, you know, from the parents is that it's something that she can do you know, to contribute you know, in a very tangible way besides caring for the child, of course, um, you know, to, um, you know, to the kid's future. So with all that said, um, that's sort of our brief update, you know, on College Bound St. Paul and uh, look forward to moving uh, this funding and this resolution forward um, as uh, we look to continue this work. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. It's when you uh, do your reports, I look at my colleagues and everyone always has a big smile on their face. It's a really wonderful update we get um, about the college accounts. And I really, when you say that um, the mayor asks everybody, I don't even um, doubt you for a minute. I can just see it. So I, it's lovely, lovely report. Are there any questions? Keep on rocking. Um, this is great. Thank you so much for the update and for taking the time. I know you had to wait a little bit to report here today, but we really appreciate it. Thank no you. problem. And of course, I want to give hat tip to Ikram Kaliso, Katrina Mendoza, um, and uh, Jess Taylor, who's now on our College Bound team. So uh, huge thanks to them. Obviously, they run the day-to-day -day of this and, uh, you know, put in Herculean efforts to mm -hmm. uh, make this run and make sure that it's really embedded, you know, uh, in the community and operated, you know, from, from an equity lens. So. Uh, huge kudos to the College Bound team as well. Right on. And I think that that goes back to um, what Dr. Elliott said about being right where we're supposed to be in spite of the pandemic and in spite of the unrest. And, um, you know, it takes that extra creativity and work and effort and commitment. So good. Thank you for the additional hat tip. We appreciate it. Um, with that, Mr. Tao moves approval. Any further discussion? Um, and that was closed public hearing and the proof. Uh, seeing none, roll call. Prince? Aye. Tao? Aye. Tobert? Yes. Yang? Aye. Jalali? Aye. Council President Brenmon? Aye. Six in favor, no one opposed. The public hearings are closed and the resolutions adopted. Mm -hmm. Item 24, resolution public hearing 21-237, amending the city's operating budget to reflect the final details resulting from the issuance of sewer revenue and refunding bonds series 2021-F. And I do not believe we have to pull version two. This is final, this is um, final details, that's right. Um, so this uh, public hearing has been held virtually as such Ms. Yang moves to close the public hearing and approve any discussion. Seeing none, roll call. Prince? Aye. Tao? Aye. Tobert? Yes. Yang? Aye. Jalali? Aye. Council President Brenmon? Aye. Six in favor, no one opposed. The public hearing is closed and the resolution is adopted. Item 25, resolution public hearing 21-238, amending the 2021 CDBG general ledger budget to reflect the actual 2021 grant award of eight of six million nine hundred sixty nine thousand eight hundred thirty eight dollars program income reported to HUD of seven thirty one thousand three seventy nine and amending the CDBG project budget to amend twenty twenty one CDBG spending plan of seven million six hundred thousand dollars. The winner, the daily double. <laughs> And I actually um, did cut it down. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just, I pictured that little uh, graphic. All right, so this public hearing has been held virtually. As such, Mr. Tolbert would move to close the public hearing and approve any discussion on the motion. Seeing none, roll call. Prince? Aye. Tao? Aye. Tolbert? Yes. Yang? Aye. Jalali? Aye. Council President Brenmon? Aye. Six in favor, no one opposed. The public hearing is closed and the resolution is adopted. Mm -hmm. Item 26, resolution public hearing 21-248, amending the public works grant budget for a local match contribution of $350,000 from partner subgrantees, city of Minneapolis. 
And this public hearing has been held virtually as such. Ms. Jalali would move to close the public hearing and approve any discussion. Seeing none, roll call. Prince? Aye. Tao? Aye. Tolbert? Yes. Yang? Aye. Jalali? Aye. Council President Brenmon? Aye. Six in favor, no one opposed. The public hearing is closed and the resolution is adopted. <clears throat> Item 27, Resolution Public Hearing 21-245, approving the final plat for Highland Bridge, third edition row homes. And on this item, I believe there is a version two in Legistar, um, Mr. Tolbert. Yeah, um, I, would just, I would just move version two, move to close the public hearing and mm -hmm. version two of this, it just adds an additional condition on the, on the plat. All right, and that, all right, so there's an additional condition on the plan. Any questions or discussion on that version two? Seeing none, uh, so moved by Mr. Tolbert, roll call. Prince? Aye. Tao? Aye. Tolbert? Yes. Yang? Aye. Jalali? Aye. Council President Brenmon? Aye. Six in favor, no one opposed. The public hearing is closed and the resolution is adopted as amended. The legislative hearing officer recommends adoption of the following resolutions as no objections to these recommendations were received. Item 28, RLH CO 21-6, 447 Brimhall Street. Item 32, RLH BBR 21-55, 914 Cook Avenue East. Item 33, RLH BBR 21-54, 679 Cottage Avenue East. Item 34, RLH BO 21-35, 936 Duchess Street. Item 36, RLH TA 21-373, 520 Fairview Avenue South. Item 36, RLH BO 21-39, 933 5th Street East. Item 38, RLH TA 21-371, 1037 Geranium Avenue East. Mm -hmm. Item 39, RLH TA 21-384, 15 Kellogg Boulevard West. Item 41, RLH BO 21-37, 402 Minnehaha Avenue West. Item 42, RLH TA 21-385, mm -hmm. 215 Otis Avenue. Item 43, RLH FCO 21-133, 1118 Pacific Street. Item 45, RLH RR 21-56, 1313 Seminary Avenue. And item 47, RLH TA 21-372, 754 Van Buren Avenue. And the motion is to adopt these items. So moved by Council Member Tao, any discussion on that motion? Seeing none, roll call. Prince? Aye. Tao? Aye. Tobert? Yes. Yang? Aye. Jalali? Aye. Council President Brenmon? Aye. Six in favor, no one opposed. The public hearings are closed and the resolutions are adopted. For the following items, no objections to the legislative hearing officer's amended recommendations were received, and therefore she recommends amendment and adoptions. Item 29, RLH TA 21-122, 899 Burr Street. Item 30, RLH RR 21-37, 1253 Cleveland Avenue North. Item 31, RLH RR 21-38, 2062 Como Avenue. Item 37, RLH TA 21-102, 1314 4th Street East. Item 40, RLH TA 21-99, 876 Margaret Street. Item 44, RLH RR 21-39, 2075 Scudder Street. And item 46, RLH TA 21-144, 551 Kent Street. And the motion is to amend and adopt these items. So moved by Mr. Tao. Any discussion on that motion? Seeing none, roll call. Prince? Aye. Tao? 
Aye. Tobert. Yes. Yang. Aye. Jalali. Aye. Council President Brenmon. Aye. Six in favor, no one opposed. The public hearings are closed and the resolutions are adopted as amended. Wow, and that's, that's a wrap? Wow. Mm -hmm. I thought I was tracking pretty well here. All right, so that brings us to the end of a big, big day um, of, with full of budget and other information. Does anyone have news from the wards or things that they would like to share quickly before we adjourn, Ms. Prince? Yes, I would just like to share that on Saturday, September 18th, so a week from this Saturday, from 10.30 to noon, the Lower Phelan Creek Project is gonna be leading a tour of Pig's Eye Park um, at, the, at the new entrance that, um, that we were able to create, um, although it isn't all completed yet, but at the end of Pig's Eye Road. And um, for more information and to register the, for the event, just go to the Lower Phelan Creek Project website. Um, uh, despite that the area is currently nestled between heavy industry, the park is really beautiful um, with its meadows, woodlands, and floodplain forest, and it's easy to see where the village of Kaposia was, and also to see the some of the wildlife that's down there, particularly the herons. Um, this is also going to be an opportunity for people to do some watercolor painting at the site, and um, Kiki Son and our former city council person will be leading that activity. So um, it starts next Saturday, September 18th at 1030 at 2165 Pig's Eye Lake Road, but be sure to register first with the Lower Phelan Creek Project. Thank you for that. Um information. I it does remind me, I think Ms. Nicker mentioned this um, a few weeks back, but the city opened up the Bob Pyram Trail um, bike connection that brings us from Harriet Island to really um, connects past um, Holman Fields Airport and all the way to Kaposia and onto the Mississippi River Trail. I had an opportunity to try it out on this glorious um, Labor Day weekend and really encourage people to go check it out. It's a wonderful connection. Um, from Harriet Island, you can head either direction, but the new Pyram Trail um, brings you past the backside of the airport, which is a place we hadn't really gotten to in the past. You go by like the legacy funeral home um, and um, then up in, up one hill, one hill into Kaposia and um, and mostly it's just kind of a nice flat rails to trails, but I really encourage people to get out there. It's cool. I'm um, speaking of being in between industry or on the river with the barges and the trains on the other side. And it's just a really cool investment and in making that connection to the Mert um, really continues to um, add to the bikeability of the city and to the connection to that trail. So check it out if you haven't already. Um, Miss Prince, your hand popped back up. Yes, because I too was on the Pyram Trail this weekend. And I just wanna second everything that you just said. It was incredible. And we took it all the way down to the Swing Bridge in Invergrove Heights, which is a beautiful little park setting. And there's a great little restaurant next door to that where the marina is and so it is you're absolutely right and um and so thank you for reminding me of that I, did you get a hill did you hit a pretty big hill getting into invergrove heights um you know we didn't okay so it's flat so i i i don't know how i missed that i think i would have noticed it but it might be after that it could be <laughs> um cool mr tolbert Just want to um, let people know that this Saturday from 11 to 4 o'clock at Edgecombe Rec Center is Matt Grove Fest. Um, it's a small neighborhood thing, um, you know, with um, lots of local businesses set up shop, promote their business, um, especially the ones that give so much back to the community throughout the year um, are usually there. Um, the, it's put on by the McAllister Groveland District Council. And uh, it's only a few years old, but it's always been one of my favorite small one day events, um, a good way to see a lot of neighbors and usually parks has some um, fun games for the kids and, and other activities for, ki for kids to play on. So check it out uh, 11 to four this Saturday at Edgecombe Rec Center. Awesome.
Love those little small neighborhood events. They're unique and fun. Um, any other news from the wards or information to share out before we go today? All right, looks like no. Thanks everybody for their hard work and digging in. We've got a big week next week. Be thinking about levy limits as we ponder through this next week. All right, thanks folks. There's nothing else to come before us. We are adjourned. Make sure you extinguish your smoking materials in a metal or glass container filled partway with sand or water.